So the way that uh, I concluded the last uh, Akashic conversation is that we are not having a pre-compiled agenda for any of these explorations, but we have, a, as you can see in this, in this Notion document, a, a, a buffer of topics that, that we can just go back to and, and, and see how they fit with the given composition of, of participants in the, in the call. Um, maybe out, I don't know if the context for all of you is, is there, who is Akasha? Um, uh, I, I think you were all there in one of the previous calls. Uh, so, but feel free to ask if we should explain anything uh, before we dive into. And then we can really just pick on a topic that we want to, that we feel like we want to explore. Um, in the space of the de-social or Web3 social uh, space. Susie's saying just a quick overview of the question. Okay. So, Mitko, you want to do it? I do. You notice the way, you notice the way I, I brought that up and then went quiet, like I wasn't going to do it. Over to yeah, Martin, yeah. over to Mitko. You yeah, see yeah, how we yeah. do that? It's teamwork. It's so seamless. Exactly. <laughs> no, let me do it. I can I can I can start and you please fill 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 in what I'm I'm, I'm missing. So Akasha is um, an experiment, an ongoing experiment uh, that was started by Miha Alizi and who founded the Akasha uh, Foundation. Um, it's when was it? Five years ago, I think, by now. And um, the Akasha Foundation has um, uh, basically um, started to embark on which is now a topic, by the way, that Vitalik just wrote a blog post on. And let's, let's pitch it, wing it this way. Uh, Non-financial use cases for the blockchain. So for, for crypto. So I think Vitalik, I haven't read his article yet, but he, he just, uh, I've seen that there, there's a new blog out on this topic. And that's actually quite close to our interest um, like uh, using uh, the Ethereum blockchain initially um, in combination with IPFS as a way to build a, uh, a, 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 a impermanent, I, I wouldn't want to say censorship resistant, although to some part this is the case, um, uh, social network that, that would uh, also um, in this decentralized way Pose alternatives to the prevalent models that are being used that are mainly uh, driven by centralized companies that are extracting profits from um, from the the user data they own essentially uh, and their and the social graphs they they keep for advertisement um, under their control um, and and then this experiment is evolving we have started to relearn the hard way that Ethereum did not scale and the transaction cost by having a, a completely on-chain social network would be uh, unbearable high at the moment. Um, so the current uh, way that we are approaching this is that we are using the crypto part as a distributed secure computing layer. Um, we are using signatures on uh, that uh, public-private public, private key signatures that you have with your Ethereum wallet as a means of authenticate and, and sign in um, to uh, what we are now calling a Akasha framework. Um, and the Akasha framework is a, is a set of uh, tools that can be used to deploy a decentralized social network. And in the future that is not there yet, anyone should be able to really create such a, um, I don't want to say instance, but like one, we call it world. Uh, I'm careful here by using words that might put the wrong pictures in your mind, right? So, and, and the first one that we have now built is Ethereum world. The name originates from the idea that we had that if we are building this framework, we need to test it somewhere. And the people that would be most likely bearing with us and coping with the deficiencies that the current web3 world still has are those that are already in the space so it might be the ethereum community uh, uh, using ethereum world and um, so currently it's just a micro blogging app but we are from there expanding it to to adding also other applications and, and features to it yeah and let me i can share the link it's it's uh, and importantly, everything we do is public domain, open source. Yeah. 
everything. Now, oh, and there's no shit coin. <laughs> and like another update that we are now uh, in the process of validating certain hypotheses that Martin has just you know described, and we are embarking on a very, I would say, uh, brave research project to understand better what are the needs of the communities in terms of social networking, communicating, authenticating, etc. And maybe like we at some point will reach out to you guys and yeah, just ask you to participate in that research if you're happy with that. Uh, it's very important. It's, uh, it will help us design our future products and, and uh, in a way that match communities' needs hmm. um, in decentralized web. Cool. Also, uh, just a little bit of context from the kernel side, Susie, is that uh, Mihai and uh, a few others wrote some really moving stuff when Ethereum was launched back in 2014 and 2015, which had always been inspiring to me. And although Akasha has been through many different iterations and versions, exploring multiple different ways of thinking about sociality in Web3, the thing that has always been attractive to me has been the nuanced understanding of identity that the people broadly grouped under the Akasha Foundation and in the framework that they've been describing have. So it's not this rather simplistic and deeply reductive notion of own your data. You know, data is property and we're going to verify you and we're going to have these credentials that somehow make the world a better place except for everybody who needs a little bit of context and nuance, you know. Uh, and it's not replicating the kinds of world that require us to prove something in order to get the basic necessities for survival, right? Like if you look in kernel, that notion of like no paradigm, right? Like we currently live under the reward oriented paradigm, which says that we have to earn what we need in order to survive. And what Marianne Brun is saying is that like, what and where is the world where society exists in order to fulfill the needs of its members in order that they might go on to do creative and inventive things. Right? Society exists in order to fulfill such that people might be more fully who they are. And almost nowhere that I look do I see anybody thinking in genuinely like generative and interesting ways about identity, about relationships, about data, <laughs> not as property, right? Not as like just shifting who controls it, who possesses it and replicating that same problematic paradigm of like control, possession and rewards. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in being rewarded for who I am. I'm, be, I'm interested in being recognized as who I am <laughs> and then having the spaces to express and explore that on my own without too much constriction from the tools that I am doing it with. So we've been exploring sociality and the nature of interfaces in these calls. And at a very simplistic level, you know, that looks like, okay, I go to akasha.ethereum.world and I click login with kernel and a very simple federation the data that you have associated with your profile and adventure in kernel can help you land in a cache world in a more contextual manner you can see oh like these are the blogs that other kernel fellows have enjoyed or like this is what other kernel fellows did and, and off you go like a simple recommendation context setting thing and that's quite a superficial level of but like doable today the deeper question that we're exploring here is you know what does interpersonal data and that kind of fuzziness actually look like in these systems and where are the best most practical places to think about like those interfaces existing because we know that you are not a node <laughs> you know you're a person <laughs> it's a very big difference and we don't want to 
slip into simplistic metaphor when talking about like humans and what we ought to be able to do with our tools. And so that federated notion of like login with kernel, login with the cache, it's still, you know, like a little bit rigid, you know, and then what happens when, okay, like I move from kernel and I go and I log into a cache and I do a whole bunch of stuff in a cache. How does that get communicated back across what, you know, like, it shouldn't be like nodes and edges, the social graph theory of identity, which actually comes from studying deviance in schools, which is horrifying and uh, a history kind of worth repeating if Philip <laughs> is feeling up to, to that. I don't want to anger him too much, though. You know, you've got to just <laughs> poke the bear once or twice. <laughs> Let's say, uh, you know, Andy, what, what is uh, the, the moment when the pressure got the, the highest and said, oh, my God, like, we need to really connect this when, when, I, when I went to the build, building kernel, kernel building kernel Friday course and you were starting uh, to discuss there the, the kernel wallet and the approach that you are trying to take by building the, the kernel wallet where you are deliberately also um, trying to not uh, um, you know, uh, maybe force the the same this address and the, and the to be the the unique one, but there might be this. I think I think you mentioned this idea of a social recovery where you could kind of swap addresses within this context of the community um, because you have other other links that in case you lost your keys, you could recover them like through a social recovery and so on. This is like very very valuable because uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a really good uh, uh, intersection and uh, approaching the challenge that we have by right now, many, many times in cases, still quite oversimplifying things by reducing, for example, the profile that you have on a, um, a Ethereum world profile to a, one Ethereum address, which is really um, a problem. How do we deal with this in the future? How can we uh, make sure that a person is not reduced to that one address and um, that if you lose that you might lose everything or if you if you are known to be the, the owner of that address you are already excluded from other places and, and so on this is a something that right now obviously is the, the simplest way to start but we should really move beyond that you know and I thought there's a there's a great overlap and in interest of experimenting you can only go there when you start walking and and experimenting with this you know and say oh how does it look if there's a kernel um community that 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 wants to fork akasha.ethereum world or that wants to join ethereum world with all their content and these are two interesting challenges that we only can experiment with you know when we do them <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So it's a fascinating question. I, I have some thoughts on this, which, I, which I'll share just like initially, you know, we haven't spected properly and certainly have not actually begun writing code in this direction yet. But the one of the most fascinating aspects of the decentralized society paper, everybody gets caught up on soul bound NFTs. One of the most fascinating uh, aspects of that paper for me was the notion that you can have security embedded in sociality. Right. So you can have this like not social recovery, but community recovery. And what is being recovered is authentic access to high bandwidth communication channels. Right. Like that, just that, that those series of words, if nothing else, really excite me. And as I think about that in the kernel context, so like the way that the system is set up at the moment is that you generate a non-custodial wallet. You have a public private key pair. The private key is completely local and we never see it, but we know what your public key is. And this public key is associated with a member ID in the kernel storage service. That member ID is in fact a snowflake ID, which was generated by Twitter, as you would have heard on last Friday's call. Uh, Twitter needed snowflake IDs because they needed a way of generating provably unique IDs in a distributed system that also contains some information in the ID, in particular information about time when it was generated. So the Snowflake ID is like an interesting web to uh, primitive that is moving towards distributed or perhaps even decentralized systems. And we ourselves have used that. So your member ID, the Snowflake ID, uh, is tied to your public key. But if you lose your wallet, 
We can do nothing to help you recover your keys in the current system, but we can, as stewards, overwrite the public key associated with your member ID. So you can generate a new wallet and all of the data that you have associated with your kernel profile, your adventure, your everything else can be once again accessible. So the data is not lost, but the keys mm. currently are. Now to imagine what community recovery looks like in this kind of context is actually rather simple, except for like the last hour, which is always where the devil is, but we'll get there. It's that we can do better than social recovery, which is like assigning four static public keys, some shard of my key that they can like recover in a three of four or a three of eight or so whatever scheme for recovery is required. If you look at Argent or these kinds of people, we can do better than that because we can do it dynamically, right? And we mm -hmm. can write some pretty simple logic in the back end in the storage service that says, if you are in a group, if you are in more than three groups with a person, assign a shard of the key we will assign a shot of their key to you. And if they request recovery, you're in a position to do that. And nobody needs to ever like see that. And those shards can shift dynamically as people like make and break associations, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me is like a very simple way of thinking about community recovery that we can like very easily implement with just a few lines of code in the back end. If you're in more than three groups with this person, or if you have like an adventure and you have organized the Yonto with them and you're in a chat channel, you know, there's many things that we can do. Mm -hmm. The big question technically there is how do we deliver <laughs> the recovered private key back to that person? Because right? there's a non-custodial wallet, we never see the private keys. We don't want to ever see the private keys. So that's like a technical thing that we have to kind of overcome. And I, you know, I have no idea how we're going to do that right now. Um, but for me, those are the kinds of interactions and moments which are most interesting to look at in terms of uh, like incentivized interfaces, you know, like is because like really what I was talking about last week in terms of like, like tokens, totems and ways of like interacting between communities is like what are the points in our systems where current approaches genuinely won't work and we need something novel because that's generally a wonderful place to think about like some mechanism design and in particular some kind of like on-chain transaction which can then be used in a wider context of for instance like community tokens right mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're, you're helping maintain this community. You're showing care for this community in a very, very clear and measurable way, right? Like we don't have to measure all the ways in which we care, but if we have some really, really clear proxies for what that means in terms of the way that the system itself operates, then we can begin to think about like those moments being verifiable on chain and being verifiably on chain generators of healthy and like careful money right because that's ultimately the goal of everything that i was talking about last week i didn't state it explicitly but like the three forms of money that we currently have, the three features of money that we need to have medium of exchange unit of account store of value right we now have like a fourth which is like a universal ledger of transactions which has never existed prior to 2009 which is very interesting and has resulted in everything that we've seen in the last 13 years but the big question is, okay, like what other things could we program into money, right? And for me, like one of the most critical primitives is like money as a measure of care or like money as a means of reciprocity. Those two things are like intimately linked. And like, that's really like what I'm most interested in globally is like, can we program money to care? <laughs> Like if we could do that, it'd be wonderful. Uh, and, and I think that like, yeah, in this context to say, okay, community recovery of keys, is there a means of ensuring that that can be done securely by some on-chain mechanism? That means we never have to actually see somebody's recovered private key. And can we use that moment on-chain to like advance the incentives within our own? Uh, infrastructure.
Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, broad sweep of thoughts. But, uh, nice. And uh, again, Susie's asked a super question, which is can you program money to care? And uh, uh, Andy and I had a thread recently where we uh, referenced Michael Linton's work from the 80s, uh, where he's, his conceptualization of open money leads to a system where together you have power with rather than somebody having power over based on bank balances. And that power with or through is, is to me, synonymous with care because it involves relationships, uh, working with rather than, like I say, exerting a, a power play over based on being a gajillionaire. <laughs> um, so there are, there are, there is, there's been uh, openmoney.org. Thanks, Charles. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's, there's been a lot of thought around community currencies, um, mm-hmm. which is sometimes spelt as current C. Can you see the current? Uh, because if you can see it, it, it falls into that old axiom of what goes around comes around, you know, in terms of that reciprocity and indirect reciprocity uh, that has held tribes, villages, towns, uh, all forms of communities together for as long as we've been social animals. If you can see it, then that plays to the evolutionary condition that we find ourselves in today. Um, so that's that's it's all it's it's all the fascinating thing about this is that it's all in the mix. Um, one of the things that I find uh, those approaching this with an engineering mindset first and foremost get wrong is they apply the axiom axiom of separation of concerns. It's such a fundamental tool in the engineer's toolkit that they just want to separate things out and. By separating things out, you break the relationships, and yet it's the contextual relationships that define the system properties. So you can't separate out the concerns. You have to understand them. You have to weave them together in a narrative so that you can begin to understand the implications of your your code. Um, I think. Let me throw something in here. I just read on open money. It says money is just information. Mm-hmm. Yes. A way, yeah. a way we, a way we measure what we trade. So trading is like a transaction, right? So now, can in, you in, help yeah. me? Now, help me. When I was so fascinated, the reason why I fought, fell as a as a biomedical researcher in this trash, trash, sorry, trap, not trash, <laughs> trap of the crypto <laughs> world, and said like, look, how cool is this? I can, I can basically like have my experiment day and i always come back to that and this is my uh, my original fascination for this i could like take this uh piece of data that i have and now i can transact this i can have a transaction of knowledge because i can you know i can write it on chain store it on a on a ipfs storage and and it's a hash that i can make transactable and so yeah so so when I claim that we can do transactions of knowledge, and that is an application outside of the bounds of traditional financial use of blockchain. Does this make sense? What do you have to say to that? Is it so? <laughs> I, I, it's interesting because it, when you say that money is just information uh, and information flows in all ecologies, in all ecosystems, uh, usually when we have an exchange of information, we call it an interaction. And then some people consider a subset of interactions to be transaction because they, in their mind, that information flow is money. So that interaction is qualified as a transaction. Whereas actually all interactions have value in them by, by their definition. They help you make sense of the world. They help us cooperate. Um, so in many ways, open money invites you to leave behind some of the um, properties in a capitalist system that are causing some of the problems and amplify the information richness Mm -hmm. uh, as as some kind of um, log of those 
of the log is perhaps again too clumsy a word, but as it's um, we're talking about ledgers, um, some log of those information flows, which is why you don't see money in a coral reef or a rainforest. They have plentiful in information flows, um, but there's no subset of those information flows that has been taken out, rarefied, and called money. So it's about perhaps, in a biomimetic sense, uh, encouraging us to return to that through sociality, through cooperation, through reputation, which needs to be very carefully defined, uh, through identity. It's all in, 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 in the mix. And we are, we are, for the first time, I think, um, able to amplify that to a point where you might call it cooperation at scale, which we've never been able to do before. If, it, if this digital technology allows us to do anything, it's to make that leap as a species to move way beyond Dunbar's number. And, and, and so that's, why that's, did... what we're, that's what we're, 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 we're we hold in our hands here. If only we could, if only we could work out how to do it. <laughs> I, I have another question and that is, so why have we apparently so far failed to achieve that? Because I would argue that the current incarnations that involve tokens and we touched it last time or so they always lead down to uh often to wrong incentives and also they lead to just uh, looking reducing it again just to the money aspect of it and this is mm -hmm. why token-based governance for example is uh yeah, for I would for argue that it's not a good way to do it, and uh, at least not um, when you don't mix identity in again. Funny enough, right? So because before, you before we go, Sorry. I would just I would like <laughs> yeah. if Susie, if you are available for it, I would love for you to tell the story of yeah. tokens in your classroom because yeah. it's one of my all-time yeah. favorites. If you're available for it, it would be very instructive in this context. It may be the case that you don't have a mic right now. Okay, no problem, no problem. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. I mean, you can also, we, we, we've got a few of these coming, so <laughs> there's always room for it in another uh, context and call. But please just drop a message in the chat in a few minutes if you, uh, if you do find a quiet place that will be non-disruptive, but no pressure, so don't, don't stress. Cool. I think um, while we're waiting for Susie to find a quiet space, I'll just offer a very short answer to your question about, you know, why is it so challenging? And I think it's partly because most people don't see the way the world works. They see the way they think the world works. Yeah, and they're not the same. Um, so, for example, um, an obsession with individuality is, uh, you know, the atomization of, of each and every one of us each and every single one of us that that doesn't really emphasize the relations or the community so uh when you when you approach code with that mindset combined with having successfully networked a bunch of machines you think that you can apply that mindset and network a bunch of people let me explore another um way of saying basically the same thing because that's what I specialize in with calls on Philip. <laughs> uh, but there's this fascinating concept of the difference between morality and consciousness. Uh, and consciousness is such a nebulous word, so you'll forgive me for using it in this context. But morality, it comes from the Latin moralis, which means um, local area, your habitation. Right, Morales. So it, it really like it referred to this valley where I was living with me and my tribe, as Philip mentioned, maybe 150 people if we were really good at coordinating, probably much less. And you can imagine that, you know, like culture is basically what we cultivate, right? So it's like the wheat and the grain, the things which nourish us, the animals on which we live. And it's deeply linked to the Morales and morality of that local area, right? Because like in my local area, I'm living in a valley, there's abundant food and good rainfall, I can grow crops, the cows therefore are sacred, right? Because we don't need to kill them for food and 
they're such wonderful animals just look into their eyes oh my gosh you know and you like hold the cow as sacred and it provides milk and all of the rest of it and that's like morally the correct thing to do but the people up on the mountain right they don't live in an abundant environment and they have to kill their cows in order to eat right and like when we go as a warring tribe up the mountain we're like you can't kill your cows they're sacred animals and then they're like well what the hell are we going to eat right and it's like this clash of necessity and morality <laughs> and that's what we see increasingly in global civilization right like it's like how on earth are we supposed to build any kind of sustainable sociality when the prism through which we see the world is a moral one right it's not possible because the morality of all of these different people from different locations different environments different habitations is, is by necessity radically different and so what, that's why i contrasted with saying like consciousness which is again like a nebulous word but what it really means like what does it mean to be awake right it's not in only a spiritual sense but also that it's to see the other as an extension of me right as a as a way of accounting for the lack in myself right and as soon as i can hold simultaneously in heart the notion that there is diversity and difference and give thanks for that because it's honestly like mysterious and miraculous and at the same time recognize that that diversity and difference is rooted in some essential similarity right then like there is the root for some genuinely sustainable community some actual humane sociality because we're no longer looking at the world through moral lenses right we're no longer saying this book not that book this practice not that practice this animal not that animal this temple not that one this money not that one you know like all of that and like of course it takes a long time <laughs> I have to drop you know all of this stuff about like music and food i mean imagine getting you know really ridiculous stodgy carbohydrate heavy british people <laughs> to eat delicious indian curry it's taken a long time <laughs> you know and they had to cause a huge amount of damage <laughs> just to make that happen those bastards <laughs> uh, so it's a it is a very interesting way of me to think about this stuff is like like how and it applies very directly for me in terms of like like the code right like what are the ways in which i can like code without putting on my like moral glasses right because you inevitably kind of have to often when you when you look at the way people have coded smart contracts so far and this kind of answers your question Nico, that i haven't really seen this kind of thing mostly because the ways in which tokens have been brought into existence mimic the current cultural conditions for the creation of money right mm -hmm. but that open money manifesto makes a very profound point further on it says like it's virtual money and the virtual is not bound by physical laws <laughs> you can do what you want right unbound by space and time you can have as many tokens as is possible if you look at the graph for dApps, right the number of votes these virtual objects in the contract is exponential it goes to you know like i actually had to cut it off not because of the limits of my imagination because of the limits of the bank or formula it couldn't handle more than like e to the 148 or however many can fit into a 256 bit number right and that's kind of fascinating that like when you truly embrace the virtual <laughs> you're like we can have whatever money we want then you do inevitably find the physical limits of the medium in which you're expressing that but that's a wonderful position to be in as opposed to like limiting yourself with your own morality. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So. So just for clarification, which, which, which graph did you mention? What was the graph that you talked about? Uh, this, I'll, sh I'll show you. Oh, let me... Cause imagine actually uh, looking at a, at a, an implementation in one of these called very exciting times uh, hmm. so it's this graph here that i'm talking about right you can see that like ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. The whole okay. idea was to try and make sure that the cost to downvote by 1% kind of increases uh, as people stake like more and more, but yeah. like increases in a decreasing, uh, at a decreasing rate until you reach some kind of like inflection point after which if you're staking more than 600,000 NS SNT on like a DAP in the system, it becomes like radically cheaper to downvote mm -hmm. your product. To the point where like if you've staked a million SNT, then like it's just enormously cheap to like move that down one percent and moving you know given that rankings in the system are just purely like if you've ranked a million SNT, your rank is a million right and so to move it down by one percent is to move it by uh what is that uh, a thousand right mm -hmm. um no ten thousand uh, so you're here, it costs you 300 SNT to move it down 10,000 SNT over here. When you've got like a hundred SNT staked, it costs you a hundred to move it down one SNT. It's like a very, mm -hmm. it took a long time to come up with this curve. And like, of course, there's no justification for what this inflection point is, which is why like it's dynamic and you can kind of experiment with like, oh, let's look at the votes, like these numbers over here, how many votes are being produced by different numbers uh for like the ceiling which i'll explain and you can see that it moves around a lot uh but there are certain places uh which i think like uh, yeah there was one that are like local minima this is 154 uh, you can get down to like about 134. So I, I, I wasn't sure that I'd ever found like a, a, a global minima for the number of votes, which go very exponential, very, very quickly mm -hmm. towards this end of the graph when we're making it like ridiculously cheap to downvote very well resourced <laughs> actors like delete yeah. Facebook. But like, this is this is virtual money, right? Like these votes never exist. <laughs> uh in like another user's wallet but they exist as objects in the contract and like they can do whatever the and have as many of them as you need to achieve the effect that you want because i'm not actually interested in votes the stated purpose of this system is very simple and it is uh i want to know the content is relevant to me and beneficial to the communities i care about right the design goal is design an economic system for curating information with no single point of failure no owner where information that ranks highly is provably valuable to network stakeholders whilst protecting against the rich. It's like yeah. a simple yeah, statement. Mm -hmm. I didn't do chemistry beyond the age of 18, um, but I did enough to sense that there's probably uh, chemical, what's the word I'm looking for? You can tell I haven't done it since 18. Chemical mixes, <coughs> Martin, help me out here, um, where, where the behavior of the, of the, the system has that characteristic i i i'd imagine That's an interesting so. point uh well it, it this, this thing um it's like i mean you maybe the titration curve could be far faster titration curve. you know i haven't said that word since i was 18 that's actually not like you do ago, isn't like it? You, do, you do have a like a certain buffer right and yes at some point, that's right and at some point it just tips as as tips. you're showing you have tipping so, points and the reason um, i wanted to make that connection is because on one hand, you can look at that and think, well, that's just some artificial mathematics that this bloke called Andy dreamt up. <laughs> but if you can relate it to a natural process and see how that works in a natural system, then we might not just see the maths for the, the tight application that Andy is talking about, but we might actually, it might in some logic, uh, help justify it, if you know what I mean, or indeed help it develop to the next the next stage so yeah if, if i know you went up with chemistry a little longer than i did uh martin to say the least so uh if if, if anything if i could just like leave that in your brain to I, I, to, to simmer fine. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, i just wonder is now when i look around at the social web3 social whatever you might want to call it um there's lots there's quite a lot going on in the last two years it's you know cash is been having a go at experiments for since 2015, I think it is. Um, but in the last 18 months, there's been an explosion of people who are using the word social in the context of Web3. Um, I, I'm, it's not clear from to me from anything they're writing or any content they're producing that they're having these kinds of conversations. 
I would perhaps inappropriately, but I'd look at them and from what they've that what they're saying to the world, I'm characterizing them as Newtonian. It, it's you know, nodes, edges, graphs, identity, you're a number. Have you got the keys to prove you've got the number? Brilliant, let's 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 crack on. You know, it's very Newtonian. I, mean, I'm, I wonder, has anybody listening to this conversation stumbled across any other group, any other conversations playing out that reminds you of this one? Because um, we are a minority at the moment, and if we could grow the minority, that would, would be very useful. Does anybody come across this kind of conversation anywhere else? Good no question. Worry. It was worth asking. <laughs> but I want to say I wouldn't want to put us out here as like the the, the elitist uh, whatever. Oh God, no! I mean, I if the world like depends that. on us, oh my word! <laughs> <laughs> Just don't let's not do that. And I think that um, that one of the, in, the interesting things, uh, observations I have really are very blunt um, is that that we do really uh, see uh, projects um, as thrive and are super exciting until really, again, it comes to the token, until the time the token gets introduced. And then it reveals it's um, necessi necessary, but, but unfortunately not perfectly thought out nature often. And, and, and you know, we've seen that, uh, yeah, it's it's this incentive design that is still often not 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 uh, right, um, and we need to really work on that. So making sure that we get beyond this, and uh, the people talking about this are generally interested in their communities and not in other other things that are just now very much uh, predominant. You know, so how many times do I need to? use MetaMask to swap so that I can maximize the airdrop that I might get at some point. Or these kind of questions are <laughs> very often <laughs> drivers of uh, use. Uh, look, we have a lot of users or participants. Uh, <laughs> Glenn, I think you had uh, some thoughts on this. Yeah, I, think, I think the only one that I've seen kind of in operation, it's not, it's not having these kind of conversations, but I think in in kind of behavior, it's been interesting, which is uh, friends with benefits, because um, they, they do have a token um, that gates that and it's an application process to get into them. There's a, so there's some connectivity between um, some of those folks. So just what they're, they're kind of more human non-digital selves, but I, I find that like the activity in that community is uncorrelated to the tokenomics, at least to some degree, or they like it's not, there, there, there's something that feels like a little bit more special about what they're doing with that sociality within that that community. Um, but most of the things I've seen built are, are pretty skeuomorphic in terms of like things like lens protocol and stuff. It's not just, you know, it, it it's not just like using those same nodes and edges. It's also like replicating the exact design structures of ad-driven business models that are based on attention economy stuff. And so it feels like very, very far from even even just doing the edge of note where you can say like you have really different relationships at least of, or at least different ways of defining it. I feel it feels pretty far from that. But I, I view all these things as stepping stones of like how do we drive adoption and these are the things that people understand and how do we kind of transition from one to the other. But um, yeah, that, that's that, those are those are at least two of the more interesting kind of ends of, of that spectrum. But those are yeah, kind of the ones I would highlight. And other, otherwise, I haven't, I haven't seen a ton that look all that much different than what we've talked about. One thing I want to check in on, uh, although it's totally fine if not, Susie, have you found a bathroom? <laughs> it's the first and only time I'll get to ask this question. <laughs> Actually, the timing was perfect because my father was coming out of his bedroom and, um, and I was heading to the bathroom. He's like, why are you taking your computer into the bathroom? <laughs> um, and, I, and then he's like, oh, you can use my room. Um, and I was like, okay, thanks. So yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm in, a, in a somewhat quiet spot, um, not in the bathroom. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think something that um, somebody had said that really, um, maybe it was Martin, that really struck me was like, you know, 
money is information, transactions of knowledge. And, uh, and, you know, when I, so just to give a, a very brief overview, um, back in the day as a classroom teacher, um, half, uh, fourth and fifth grade with the fourth graders, this was maybe my third or fourth year teaching um, that halfway through the year, I was like, you know what, let's, let's try something different. Um, we, you know, put it under the uh, disguise of starting businesses because the, the school would never let me do like what I was doing. Um, but, uh, and in, in starting businesses, it was really like, you know, what I was curious about is like, how, you know, what are some more tangible ways to help these 10 year olds um, understand um, how to live their values, how to, you know, make mistakes and how to start to really embrace and lean into who they are and figure out ways to experiment with who they want to be. And so, um, and, you know, with, with starting a business, I was like, well, they're going to need some capital. And so the capital was in the form of these essentially raffle tickets that they called good time tickets. I now realize that it's like a community token um, because their motto was that everyone essentially deserves to have a good time. And um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because like the, the leaf blower person is outside the window right now. I don't know if you all can still hear me. <laughs> we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, all right, great. Because it's like very loud over here. Um, and yeah, so like everybody deserves to have a good time. And so of course the kids were super curious, like how do we earn these tokens? And every, for me, what's most important when we start the classroom at the beginning of the year is for the students to come up with like, you know, what does it mean to create a community, to create a place, to create moments in time, to create a feeling where everyone can thrive? And, you know, what does that mean for each of us? And so they would come up, you know, like the whole first week basically was like this art project of them trying to express this. Um, and, you know, of course, the school would be like, what the hell are you doing? You know, we need to be adding some numbers over there. Um, and then I would use that basically to say, OK, well, if this is our if this is our foundation, if this is, you know, what we're using to seed everything that we do. This is what we're using to keep ourselves accountable. Um, this is what I'm going to use in terms of these good time tickets. Um, so that, you know, as you're living these values out loud, which you have been doing already, um, you know, you're going to be able to earn these good time tickets, which then you can put towards starting your businesses. And at first I was concerned because I thought they would just do things for this external value. And a couple of them did because they were like, let me game the system. But what was super interesting was what they were really gaming was doing good things for themselves and each other. And that became more important to them. And it, at one point, one of the students came up to me and said, you know, because I said to them, look, there's going to be a finite number of good time tickets in, you know, within circulation. That was really, it wasn't anything like smart on my end. It was, I don't want to keep going to the dollar store and buying good time tickets. And so one of the kids came up to me and was like, hey, you know, could we give our tickets to each other? And I was like, you know, tell me more. And basically they were like, you know, you're you know, when we're doing certain things, you know, we're essentially earning these tickets and just to make it clear, um, to help them grow and to help them better understand and, and experiment with the things that they could do, they had to be consistent. So they couldn't, they didn't just get tickets to get tickets. And over time, because they would set goals of things that they wanted to try and explore, once both of us, you know, the student and myself felt confident that they, you know, they had really engaged in this, they knew that they would earn very few tickets for that moving forward because it now is about trying something else and they would mm -hmm. get tickets to, you know, try that out. And so for me, it was like, how do I capture these moments in real time? Um, and how can we use that information? What will they do with it? How will it shape what they do, how they interact, ways they imagine what's possible, what will happen when they start to combine forces, which they did. Um, and how can we like use this information? Because I never thought about it as money as information until today. So thank you, Martin. Um, because what is happening here is helping me kind of bring a narrative to what we were doing. Um, so how can we use 
this to communicate and learn about what happens in the space between. And I think that's really important. Um, and then what does it mean for us as a community in terms of how are we growing and how are we shaping our world? And it really started with like just me wanting to create more feedback loops and, and communicate these feedback loops with something other than this, you know, with, with the traditional words or no, you know, like what else could we use that could also hold other things and they could do things with as well. Because when I'm imparting something to them, it's like adult to, to student. And, you know, something that Philip, you said earlier, which has very much been a motto of kind of how I, how I think about things is it's power with instead of power over. So how do you, you know, shift that dynamic? Um, and, you know, it was really interesting for them, you know, and also with regards to these businesses, that it had to be things that serve their community. You know, so whether they, it could be something like they noticed kids don't maybe have access to as many toys. So one kid started a toy rental business. Um, another kid started, um, you know, realized there were kids that were super unorganized. And really it was just like, you know, uh, executive functioning skills. The kid didn't know that, but was like, I'm going to set up a little like train the trainer. How can I help you be more organized? Um, and then you can go train somebody else. Like there were lots of like these really interesting businesses. Um, and so, and sure, at the end of the day, they could buy these services with these tokens and they could bootstrap more businesses with these tokens, but it was really so much more than that. Mm. Lovely, lovely story. Yeah. Susie, if you, if, and there's no pressure expectation, but if you ever wanted to write that up, I would uh, publish that everywhere I can. <laughs> oh, <laughs> amazing. Uh, so it's, it's no, I think these, if you, you know, if I think these, to. like these gatherings also are helping me capture I kind of just did it and it kind of kept moving and never thought anybody would really value it and didn't realize how much it would play and inform so much of what I'm doing today. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know that you have an open home for any thoughts on that. So please. I oh, appreciate so, all of you. Charles. Um, it's been a while since I talked to Michael Linton, but um, I think Philip, you probably know him even better, but I, I know him pretty well. Um, and he's got a, a game, I, you know, I, I don't keep track of, of what's sort of active for him, but he did um, make a game, a quite a, a simple one um, that, that works. And, and I think, Susie, listening to you, I think it actually would, would work for almost everything that you described, maybe sort of. So we can find out, but I think whatever he's got, we can use probably to good effect. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, I'll, I'll explore. I want to um, make one last kind of point because I do have a fireside that I'm going to have to move to in the next kind of five minutes. But, um, you know, the thing that I find, one of the many things that I find so inspiring about Su Susie's story and which is really instructive and we've talked about on this call before is that, you know, having education or an epistemic community <laughs> to use much more complicated words than are necessary. People who are learning together is like a very interesting way of uh, corralling sociality, right? It's like when we enter a DAO and the DAO's purpose is to do governance, then it becomes too much navel gazing, right? It's too self-recursive and it destroys itself. It's the same thing with like social media in many regards, right? It's like, if the point is to be social, it never, it doesn't have a raison d'etre. It doesn't go anywhere, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. and this is why like Twitter is slightly less toxic than Facebook is because like it's a micro. People are there to write. You know, there's like some purpose. It's not very well handled, perhaps in many ways, right? But like there is something other. There, there's some action. You know, there's, 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 and that's it's interesting to me as I think about these things and as I think about like worlds which are interacting in many ways is that like. Like, is there, are there ways of framing, and this hopefully will convince Kokeb to join us next time and talk a little bit about this. Are there ways of framing like purpose and sociality together so that like yes. people are gathering for a reason and like community is the supporting structure which emerges as like a wonderful success metric of what you're doing, not as the goal for which you're designing. 
And that difference to me has been one that like Colonel has made very apparent and is honestly like quite surprising uh, because I think many people in Web3 think about it in almost exactly the opposite way. It's awesome. And it's a magic key of Colonel, you know, that's the magic <laughs> that you achieve there in Colonel, I think really, yeah. It's really cool. Thanks, Andy, for this. Uh, I guess last words, because I, I know you need to move and to, you are going to boot us <laughs> out of this call. But that was, that was a wonderful session, really. Uh, I really look forward uh, to the next one, you know, and um, and there's I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to boot you. Uh, if you would like no, to, ah, uh, well, let me just quickly do this where I will. Voila, magic, off you go. <laughs> there might be some, some, some couple, of, couple of threads coming out of this discussion. Yeah. It was really nice, okay. really amazing. Perfect. So I, I will drop. Please feel free to continue. All right. Okay, but I strongly, please tell us a little bit about purpose-driven contracts and like that kind of stuff. It would be wonderful to mm. have that. Uh, and I will excuse myself, but catch up on the recording. You look very beautiful mm. today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's honestly always a delight to have you. And I'm so sorry that I have to leave rudely. Uh, thank you so much. Bye bye. Go well, everyone. Bye. <laughs> well, I have to jump too, but just want to just want to say thank you all, and looking forward to yeah. chatting again next time. Cheers, guys. Yeah, cool. Yeah, bye. likewise. Bye bye. Bye again. Bye, Charles. Cheers. Philip, did you maybe just just for one? I'm going to jump to the fireside too. But um, you uh, you keep up with Winton and or did you see his game? It's been around for a, a bit. It has. I I have come across it and I've just tried to search for it to put the link and I can't find it. He. I have to say, Michael Linton is a, an amazing mind, but I don't think he's discovered search engine optimization. <laughs> oh, right. Well, and a lot of his stuff is not updated in terms of the main sites, and then you have to sort of you find the, the nooks and crannies of Google Docs. And yeah, he, he, I often ask, tell him that he hasn't necessarily made it easy for people to follow. Indeed. But it's, <laughs> it's this um, um, CC college, right? The com uh, community currency college, as it were, and, and he had this idea of, of cohorts of six with this, now I'm just remembering more, but anyway, I can just reach out and see if he wants to come around sometime, if he gets up that early over there. Yes, he's on Victoria Island, isn't he? So that's uh, nine hours uh, difference to CEST. Yeah, he, he, may, he, may, he may be into it. I, I, it would be a good chance to, to reconnect with him. So, And um, yeah, I'm glad Andy, Andy prompted um, Coco and um, we're talking about this, um, purpose-driven contract. So more to come on that for sure. And I think Glenn, Glenn has been in, in that conversation. So we'll, we have some things to bring. Sweet. Fantastic. Cheers, Charles. Yay. Always a pleasure. Okay. Until soon. Bye, Charles. Thanks, Cody. Cool. All right. So let's say bye. Okay, call it a day. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Bye Take bye. care. See you soon.